Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as you are now all relocated, we'll continue the program with geolocation. And we're going to do that with Richard Lonsdown. Um, he's now been working at uh, Semtech for already 20 years as the solution architect. Uh, he has been responsible for delivering Semtech's native geolocation solutions. And perhaps also interesting to know, way back in the 90s, 95, he was the first guy to get a mobile phone running for 100 hours. Well, that's a kind of a hero. But today he will be talking about geolocation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard London. <laughs> Hey, hey, it's great to be here. Let me just step my timer up so that I know where I am. If I can just absorb 1% of the coolness of this room, then I'll go away a better man. I mean, honestly, I bought new shoes for this because Vinka said I looked a bit corporate. So this is me trying to not look corporate. So, OK, let's, let's, let's crack on. Um, I've been playing with this uh, geolocation technology with uh, Laura Wan now for, for two, two, three years. And we've learned a little bit along the way. And I'd like to share some of the, uh, the experiences that, that we've created a kind of a, a plan to really make something that can, can become really useful and solve real life applications. Um, right, right, as Wink, Wink has said, uh, we've, we've kind of crested that hype thing. We've actually, with geolocation in some respects, gone through a little bit of the disillusionment, and we're actually now starting to come out of the other side. So we're really, uh, really cooking on gas now. So why do we all care? It is clearly the single most important IoT value add. Um, we, we use it for you know, managing risk from uh, fencing uh, an insurance risk from one place to another, to uh, detecting floods, avalanches, all that kind of stuff, safety based things. Of course, we understand that if we know where things are, we can build a better route, we can go there faster and avoid problems. Um, this kind of satisfying emotional needs is something, you know, where's my bag, where's my bike, where's my child? All of those kind of things are starting to, people are starting to want to uh, uh, understand a lot more about that. And of course, we all understand that crowdsourced data is, is big, hugely valuable, and once you start to geotag, it becomes way more valuable. So my problem today is that I see the first thing someone says when I say I'm involved in the, the geolocation for Laura, they say, how accurate is it? And like all good politicians, I don't answer the question because the application's true needs are not measured in meters or feet. They're what do you need to make a decision at that point in that application. So we have many technological solutions, be them uh, Wi-Fi, GNSS, LoRaWAN, all of these technological solutions, all of which have a set of parameters. They have a cost of power, they have a cost in terms of the uh, actual cost of the chip, and maybe a cost to use, depending on if you've got to do some kind of lookup. We really need to focus on the application's true needs. So. This is uh, what Google thought I got up to the other day. And being British, I've got something here which says, I went to three places. I was at home. I went to the Semtech office, and I went to the pub. Because that's what we do in the UK. <laughs> so the blue line is where Google think I, thought I went. And this, this is quite recent. It was the 23rd of January. Um, and it's just said, well, I kind of learned, because I'm in his phone, and he does this stuff all the time. He goes that way, and he goes that way, and I, I have no idea what that loop was. So it's done a snap to road. It doesn't know all of those points. It doesn't need to. You know, at the end of the day, who cares? Go on your Google timeline. There's all sorts of nonsense on there. It says, did you really go here? Do you want to edit this and change this? And how does it do it? Inside your phone is all kinds of technology, and we just throw it at the problem. The app says, where am I? We say, we've got a, a GNSS device. We can tell them a cell out there. We've got Wi-Fi access points. We have signal of opportunity everywhere. Sniff everything, 
and send a bucket load of data back to the network and offload the problem to Google, Apple, Microsoft, whoever you like. In this, it's just used some snap to road. You know, if, if, if you, um, I guess we're quite close to TomTom. -tom. If you're driving along on your TomTom, -tom, it uses snap to road and we've seen it. We turn off, we do what it doesn't expect. We carry on on that road and you jump to the road you actually took. So then it does a reroute. So all of that is a mixing of technologies. So on my trip to the pub, I lost my iPad. So I've gone to find my phone and there's a big, big circle. And we say, wow, it could be in any one of these houses. However, am I going to find my iPad? This is not good enough. Clearly, it's not using GNSS. It's probably not using cell triangulation, given where I live. Probably using Wi-Fi access points could be doing reverse lookup on my IP address. But do you know what? On that timeline, we know. I was at home, in the pub, or in the office. Or in some kind of mix. I'm not sure how many uh, hours were spent in each one. So the iPad's actually here in my house. And it's either going to be in the car or in the house. So what do I do? I don't need to know any more accurately than that. I just go in my house. Now I go, I've lost my iPhone, and make it make a noise. I can hear it. So I've used a different technology. I've used now Audible. So I've switched from one to another because here, GPS doesn't work. It's right in my house. Here's another example where I decided to look at one of my kids. Uh, iPhones, and the little blue circle is way smaller than the green dot in this case. It's clearly using GNSS, and I don't actually even need to know where they are in this case. It just happens to be okay. And it's just a very different story, but it's using a lot of power. What do we know? This is me on uh, one of my trips to China um, with location services on. Look at this. Google services, Android system, Android OS. Google. Look at my battery. It says I've got five hours left. Five hours! No wonder I have to charge it every day. So, in terms of our low-power IoT devices, our cellular device has got infinite resources. It can, you can use as much battery, life, uh, battery power as you like. It's got unlimited bandwidth. We've got low latency. The network can ask us questions and we can answer. So, that's not going to work for IoT. We need something a little bit smarter. So, what are our choices? Uh, we know about GPS and GNSS, high accuracy, but we need some uh, dedicated hardware, it's outdoor only. We understand what we need for beacons, again, high accuracy, but we've got to stick these things everywhere. Um, we might use cell ID from sniffing um, cellular, Wi-Fi, Laura Wan. So all of these technologies are there, and we've got to create some kind of solution that solves a real problem. So G GPS, I call it GNSS because I spent a little bit of uh, time working with those guys who um, uh, they get a bit upset if they don't happen to have GPS, and you call it GPS. So this is on top of my house. You're beginning to know where I live. Um, this is a raw unfiltered GNSS, measured over a few days. So most of the time it's within 10 meters. But guess what? This thing thinks we're 700 meters away sometimes, right up there. This is a 1.4 kilometers from there to there, and that's just in a few days. So we're going to fire up our device. We say, oh, we just use GPS. How do you know if you get one of those results? We've got to qualify that data somehow. We've got to filter. We've got to be a little bit more intelligent. So, I've been working with um, Johan on putting a cloud location service together. So, we've put this, we've created integration with uh, the community network, and this is my arrival uh, up to the um, uh, Amsterdam Hilton for the Law Alliance meeting the other day. So, if I, this is a track, the red lines, and this is using received signal strength of the gateways here in Amsterdam. Now, if I look over here, actually, I never went anywhere near Nice. How could this possibly happen? And the reality is, some of you guys out there 
have told us where your gateway is, and it isn't. So here on our community network, we're all working together, right? Except the joker who put his gateway at position 10, 20. So somehow, we've got to filter this out. We've got to find ways to say, hmm, don't believe that one. So now, guess what? We're building a blacklist. So out there in your community, if you want to be friends with us, don't get on the gateway get blacklist. So let's look a little bit more into some verticals because what in reality is any particular vertical, you cannot solve it with one technology. Here's a logistics vertical. You're, you put something on your package, you put it into a, a truck, you're manufacturing a whole load of stuff and it goes off to the warehouse. You can use LoRaWAN to track it, see it go along the road. You get into the warehouse, did it move? Which shelf is it? Where is it in the warehouse? I want to find it. That's not going to work on Nora One. You're going to need some kind of beacon solution or something inside. And guess what? You now distribute this through a third party. It goes through their hubs. It goes through on their trucks. You haven't got the same beacons there. So you're going to have to pass through, in most of our experience, in a logistics thing, you pass through seven ecosystems for location purposes. So we've got to be a little bit more intelligent here. We've got to understand what we're going to do with it. Here's, here's a cow. Um, we've been uh, talking about to cows swallowing LoRaWAN devices here in uh, the Netherlands for quite a while. I'm not sure if anyone's here from there. I, don't, I haven't seen the guys who do uh, pills for cows. But basically, let's, try with, let's imagine we're trying to monitor our dairy cow. We want to know which milking store he was in. She. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. So maybe, maybe in the field our GNSS might work, but it's not going to work to tell us which milking store she's there and, and to medicate and measure output and, and optimize. But we could use LoRaWAN out in the field, no problem. So somehow we've got to start building sensors with multiple technologies. Why would you put a GPS device in the collar of your dog who spends 95% of its time in your house? It just seems a touch crazy, doesn't it? However, if I'm going to sniff Wi-Fi at home to tell me I'm at home, that isn't going to work in the woods. It's pretty simple. We're going to have to build sense into our dog collar to say, Wake up, hmm, do I see the home Wi-Fi? Yes, I'm at home. I can send a minimum size LoRa packet to just say I'm at home. Did I, if I didn't see it, now we start to make another decision. So these, this is what um, uh, Nicola was talking about earlier on, about pushing simple but critical decision making into the device. Our device has to be cheap, it has to be simple, a low memory footprint, but these decision making uh, uh, triggers, these event matrix, has to be inc is incredibly important and really needs to be there. So, hands up who thinks they're a technologist? Who invents stuff? Right, yes. So, so I work for Semtech, I think we're technologists. What we do is, we say, give us some data from your gateways, some metadata, and we'll try and tell you where you are. That's a problem, a solution to a problem which we don't know why you need to know. And quite frankly, you don't even, there's no reason why you'd tell us. An application innovator is the person building that pet tracker, that logistics solution, that safety monitoring system. They know what they need when. So, in our vision, we see, understand, if you're a technologist, really, really understand what your technology can do Publish how the, the criteria by which it, it can deliver it, you know, what the, the deployment you need, what kind of uh, performance you can get under certain circumstances, and let the application innovators choose from the technologies available and choose when to switch them on and when to switch them off. So, we've created something. Um, it's called Colos. 
It's a collaborative location service. We think that there's a basket here of ingredients. These are location service ingredients. LoRaWAN, so Semtech will provide LoRaWAN location. Wi-Fi, there's plenty of guys providing a Wi-Fi lookup. Cell ID, again, different people. BLE, all of these technology, they're ingredients of a, of a full solution. Over here, you've got the people making the tag, making the solution, the people that really understand the problem. They could create a solution which says, here's the simple event triggers we push down to the device that says when we turn something on, when we turn it off, when do we, uh, when do we, how do we optimize that, and potentially putting an SDK down onto the device. I've been playing with uh, the PyCom uh, LoPy device. So this has a Python script library, and if you want to do a Wi-Fi scan, you just go, scan. And it comes back with all the Wi-Fi addresses it sees. Now, if we want to super optimize that for our dog, we want to say, look at this channel for this MAC address. To, if you see it, jump out, go back to sleep, send the packet. That, so we, here in this room, start needing to take these libraries that are provided for all these developer kits and really start to dive down deep and share and say, this is really going to start solving, really start tweaking, turning, turning the nut. Um, briefly, in the introduction, you mentioned back in the, in the, in the 90s when I was um, uh, a younger man, we were working on, um, on mobile phones. And uh, the standby time of a phone, we took it from one generation, went from 12 hours to 15 hours. Marketing wanted 30 hours. And we took this thing, we threw, threw everything away, and we said, how can we think differently? We developed a system which turned off the time base of the device, which held it in the network, and managed to make it work on a watch crystal. It took us a couple years to work this through, but when we finished, we chased every last signal down. We made sure that when we powered it, it went to sleep, there was no current going through pull-up resistors and pull-downs. We hit 100 hours. It completely blew the market away. Nokia mobile phones went like this, and it was a change of the way everyone thinks. Because they opened up the phone, they said, how can this phone be connected to the network? The oscillator's off. Because it only turned on every time there was a potential page for the network. We've got to think like that. We've got to dive in and say, this library's not good enough. We need to be diving in, tweaking, and making new ones. So coming back to Colos, I'm expecting people to come into Colos and say, OK, is there, um, is there something for my dog collar? If not, what else is there? Is there something similar that I can use? Use the application knowledge to change it up, to make a new recipe, optimize, and publish it back into Colos. It's there, and it becomes this API marketplace and con continually developing and growing solution. Why is this important? So, we really need to, I guess, go back into the, the network layers and understand who owns what. So our device is put out there to do a job. It's measuring a temperature, a pressure, or a vibration, whatever it is. This is payload data. It goes through the LoRaWAN network, and it belongs to the person who's got the, uh, the application, and it gets delivered to the dashboard in the IoT platform. That is their data. It doesn't belong to the network. The network has captured metadata, time of arrival, signal strengths, from the, the gateways. They own that. If we want to make a hybrid solution and bring these things together, those two things have to meet, and they've got to bridge the two network layers, because they, can't, they don't see each other normally. So our solution is to subscribe to a metadata feed from the network into the IoT platform, and to let it all meet inside Colos and make a full hybrid solution. So this is basically one place we're trying to create a go-to spot 
where everyone comes for collaborating on location services. So we're just now entering into a private preview and we're opening this up to the TTN community. Johan will switch the, uh, the integration on in just a few days, right? Next week. Next week. So the, uh, the integration will pop up there. You can go and get yourself on the community network free geolocation using Semtex solvers driving this for all of this, uh, uh, all of the community network. The uh, TTN guys are also powering the LoRa, Can LoRa Academy program. So this is an important part of the LoRa Academy. We want to see developers creating these recipes, creating these very important uh, uh, optimizations because we've got to drive that battery power, battery consumption down. We're clearly working with a, a bunch of others. There's um, you know, other network operators that will be uh, having access to this. And these are our expectations. This is not commercial. You accept the fact that this stuff is going to be, you know, some, somewhat is going to maybe be sub, uh, subject to the locations that are programmed by the TTN community guys. So we may need to start building our algorithms for blacklisting those location gateways. We need to feed back the issues and the user experience. And if we ask you, I'd really like you to participate in um, focus groups so that we can really tune the user experience before this goes um, super big. So it's a very exciting development. TTN is the first network using this, and this is going to be a big story, I'm pretty sure. So there's, some, uh, there's, a, there's a portal, uh, the standard kind of things that you're all used to, all you guys just do that, and it happens. So. There you go. It's a multi-vendor marketplace for location APIs where we're looking to combine, mix, and build and create new services, building on top of one another, publishing the resulting services to back to the marketplace. So quick timeline. Uh, we started looking at this uh, just over a year ago. Uh, Stola Pedersen and I um, really homed in on this collaborative concept about almost a year ago now, and we've been playing around with this in private preview for, for a month or so. Uh, this will go completely at the moment. We approve all signups, uh, but uh, we'll go completely open with instant signups um, somewhere about the middle of this year, depending on some, how we, we tweak that user experience. So you can go there, uh, you, can, you can apply, and um, that's pretty much it. So, there you go. Thank you very much, Richard Lantham. Um, and also great news that, that uh, Colos is being integrated with the Things Network these days, but while the community is here, you need any help from uh, yeah, people sure here? Yes, sure we do. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what can we do to help you out? Uh, number one, tell us the correct location of your gateway. <laughs> Yeah. Don't spoof it. <laughs> number two, start deploying um, timestamp gateways, V2s. There's a number of them available. Um, and number three, really start trying to make some of our developer kits into devices that can sit out there and last for months and years, whereas most of the time when you use a developer kit, the, the libraries are not fully optimized. You know, and you guys, you guys do this stuff in your sleep. Yeah. I assume you will be DDoSed with requests, but Johan Stocking is also in the house, so you can also approach him. Are there other folks helping out that you can approach? Yeah, so uh, info at colos.org, get everything you need. Okay. So there was, there's going to be a, a, like a, a community group and forums and all that stuff, but that's not in place yet. Yeah. Grand, thank you. Any questions or remarks? Yeah, over there. Uh, oh, over there, yeah. Hello, where are you from? Hi, I'm Thomas from uh, IoT Zurich. Yeah, I hold it. And my question is, how does this non-commercial clause go together with the basic principle of open source that you shouldn't discriminate against fields of endeavor? Uh -huh. So th this is not open source. This is a collaborative uh, marketplace where each contributes. So, that, so 
whilst it's 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 uh, an integration on the Things Network, it's not open source per se. So it's it's something where we can uh, work together and we can put solutions and. Rather like the Law Alliance, we don't define any business model. If people want to put stuff in there that is open source, they can. But if they want to uh, earn money on it eventually, um, the terms that right now are non-commercial. So we cannot, they can't make money on it right now. But you know that, that will change in the future. Thanks. Is that a satisfactory answer? <laughs> More or less, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. Any other? Ah, yeah, it's Simon again. Hello. Again. Our serial questionnaire. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I'm being, if, if you're like a politician, I'm being like a hard-hitting journalist. So what is the accuracy? What figures do you have? From so, TTN Switzerland, I am, Simon. <laughs> okay. So um, let's, let's talk about kind of, uh, wh where's the best case? So there's going to be Tim Van Dam from the Internet of Life is going to be presenting some of his stuff, um, I think, on Saturday. Uh, maybe tomorrow, but he's he's basically embedded these things in the horns of rhinos. Um, he's worked, you know, we've worked completely with him to put this solution out on on hilltops in Tanzania, where the gateways are separated by 10 kilometers, and he's seeing average accuracies of 20 meters. So that's kind of a best case, right? That is out there in the wilderness with no city reflections. In the cities, then we see much more variable depending on deployment um, scenarios. So we, we say expect kind of in the region of 100 meters, but sometimes it's better, sometimes it's a little bit worse. So it's not about the accuracy of LoRaWAN, it's about using the mix of things to make decisions on what you do when. Thank you. Last call for questions or remarks. Yes, over there. Hello, who are you? Uh, Elliot from the Things Network New York. Ah. Um, so what you're rolling out, will that be uh, the integration? Will it have uh, RSSI or is it only for TDOA Both. gateways? Both. Huh? Both? Yeah. Okay. And, um, and we're starting to you know, put together, for example, there's we, we've put uh, an initial recipe in there, which is mixing Wi-Fi and LoRa. So you just send what you have, and it'll do the best it can and come back with you. Uh, and uh, if, if you want to uh, pick, pick up with me later on, I've got some demos in my pockets and that kind of stuff. It's, it's working today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Richard Lonsdome. <laughs> <laughs>